Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Experience Maker Show. I'm your host, Dan Gingis, customer experience speaker and coach. Always happy to have you here. As a lot of you know about me, I spent 20 plus years in corporate America, but not in customer experience for most of it. I actually was a marketer. And so today I always look at customer experience from a marketer's lens. So I am so excited to have here today as my guest, the marketing goddess herself. She's a keynote speaker. She is the chief content officer of Marketing Profs and the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of Everybody Writes. Please welcome Anne Handley to the show. How you doing, Anne? Hello, how are you? Oh, I am great. I've been so excited to talk with you. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I know how busy and in demand you are. Uh, so thanks for uh, for joining our little show. Yeah, I'm um, delighted to be here. I felt like we could we should opened up with a little bit of a dance party, though, don't you think? It's like that that show music at the beginning. You know, you know I was all like, we get to rock, and I saw you dancing backstage there. <laughs> That was awesome. Creeper. Such a creeper. I'm sorry everybody else couldn't see it. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm, but, I'm not, actually. But, okay. So, Anne, let's just jump right into it. You've, you've been in the marketing business for a long, long time. And I remember hearing you speak at Social Media Marketing World a couple of years ago. And I noted that although you weren't necessarily saying the words customer experience, you were really focused on things like listening to your customer in order to come up with uh, with writing ideas. And the things that you were saying in your keynote, to me, felt like you might as well have been a customer experience person as well as a marketing person. Can you just walk us through how do you how do you think about that? And and how does uh, listening to your customers help you come up with things to write? Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Because uh, I think, you know, I, I wrote the forward to your book, Dan, and I remember when you first approached me and you said, oh, I'm writing this book about customer experience. And I'm like, I'm not a CX person. Like, why is he coming to me? And then I don't know if you remember this, but you detailed out, well, here's what you talk about. You, we're just using different words, but we're basically saying the same thing. Thinking about how do we put our customer at the heart of our not just our content and our marketing, but our entire company. You know, how do we build our communication around them? I have always taken a very customer-centric approach to, you know, in my world, creating content and writing and thinking about marketing programs that truly do put the customer at the heart of, of, um, of the plan, of the strategy, of, of everything. And, you know, that's a challenge for a, a lot of marketers, a lot of companies. And so I basically what I realized is that, yes, you and I actually do, we're, we're sort of, you know, we're, what's, what's the thing? Like we're, we're singing from the same hymn book. It's just that I think we have slightly different words and how we describe things. But yeah, very much, um, very much aligned in that way. So as to your question, you know, how do I, how do I think about that? I mean, I think the, the tragedy is, is so often that so many marketers aren't out there directly speaking to their customers or their prospects. They have a vague notion of, of who they talk to from maybe a demographic standpoint, sometimes a geographic standpoint, but they have less of a familiarity with who they are from a psychographic standpoint. And so, you know, I think that to me is, is, my, is the first step that I always think about. It's like, I think about one specific person who, I am writing to, I'm communicating with, whether it's for you know my own uh, keynotes or, or I, I think about that one person in the audience who I'm trying to help. Sometimes it's for my email newsletter. I write to one person. I've talked about that uh, quite a bit. Or even on you know on the marketing prop side of things, when we are developing our education, our training programs, we think about the one person who we're trying to help. And so I think you know bringing it down to just the individual level. The irony is the more specific you get when you think about your, your marketing in terms of that, the more universal it will, it will be um, if you, you know, think of the right person. And so, so yeah, that's, that's sort of how I approach it and how I think about it. And I think very much where, where you and I align. Yeah, I, that's great. I, I want to give you a quick story from my first job right out of college. I worked for a company called <laughs> the Danbury Mint, which sells oh, high yeah. end. Products. So, you know, plates, dolls, figurines, that sort of thing. And I started in the classic car replica department. And these are 124th scale, they're about this big of classic cars. They're, they sell for about $150 each. They are made of 
a lot of the same components as the real car. So like if the car had leather seats, these have leather seats, the, the paint chips are matched meticulously. And I didn't know a whole lot about cars, but I was, but I was asked to start selling these, this line of cars. And one of the things that I learned very quickly was that the people that were buying, say the 57 Chevy replica, were getting it in the mail, taking it out to the garage, and comparing it to the real thing, which was in their garage. And so we had to be absolutely perfect. And I remember having this conversation with a guy that had a 62 Corvette in his garage, and he was telling me about how the air hose was in the wrong place underneath the, the hood, and it should have been going under something instead of over it. And I have no idea what you're talking about, sir. But I went and got the replica out and had him walk me through it, and he was right. And we ended up fixing that and I made sure he got the first one off the production line. But what it taught me was, I'm not a car guy, but here I am selling these cars. I better get to know what these car guys are like because otherwise I'm gonna fail miserably at this job. And uh, so it's totally right. I love the idea of looking at that one person as well. I think both in marketing and customer experience, we talk about personas, but mm -hmm. I've always struggled with that because it tries to wrap people into this invisible concept that isn't really yes. any person. It's a combination of lots of people, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're composites. And I, I think you can't build a relationship with a composite, you know, it just doesn't work. Um, and so, you know, I, I think personas are a place to start, but I, I think it's, we need to go one level deeper than that. You know, my experience, Dan, is that with a lot of companies, when you ask them, you know, who they sell to, they're really good at, at, you know, at quoting things at, at like a demographic standpoint, or they know the persona. Well, we sell to Mary, you know, she's a mid-level marketer and she works at this, you know, tech company. It's like, okay, but who is that person? You don't, you don't, you don't feel like, you don't feel like the, the heart and soul of Mary. Like you don't feel that pumping, you know, you don't feel blood pumping through her veins. And I think that's so important because even at, you know, at B2B companies, we build relationships with people and it's so cliche. Like I feel almost cliched saying that to you, you know, right here and to everybody watching, um, but it's 100% true. And I think it's the, it's the difference between sort of mediocre marketing and truly spectacular marketing and customer experience. You know, the, the question I got the most often when I walked off a physical stage back when we were on physical stages. Oh it, yeah, I remember those days. Yeah, yeah. they were such great days. It was always somebody from a B2B company and they'd come up to me and they'd say, oh, great presentation. I was really inspired. Does what you talk about apply to B2B companies? And I would always, I, I kind of perfected this. I would, I would stand there, you know, very straight faced and I'd say, well, that depends. Are you marketing to human beings? And then yeah. <laughs> they'd be like, well, yeah, I'm like then it, then it applies because the people that are buying your product are people, they're consumers. And they're not, you're not selling to a building or to a, you know, to an entity. And I think the more that especially B2B companies can realize that. And that's what I talked about when, when I uh, had the privilege of speaking at your uh, B2B marketing mm -hmm. event, uh, yeah. was that this is very much uh, for B2B companies as well. Uh, we've got yeah, a lot that's of true. comments. So we got a lot of comments coming in from the audience. I want to share some of them, but I did, you mentioned your newsletter and I wanted to make sure we came back to it. Your newsletter is up for, a couple of awards, I believe. Will you tell us about it and uh, tell us how we can go and vote for you? <laughs> I actually think is is it uh, is it still open? I don't know. Um, oh, I yeah. Your post, I think, this morning. So I so I think so. Oh, okay. Let's let's just say yes. Let's just go with a yes. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So news newsletter fest is a week long celebration of newsletters. They are recognizing excellence in newsletters of all kinds. Um, everything from, you know, the morning brew, you know, fantastic news curation, um, newsletter, uh, curated news newsletter to, you know, B2B companies, to brands, to individuals. So, yeah, they had nominated um, me, which was really gratifying uh, as a as a C-suite newsletter, basically. Um, so, yeah, you can, I think if you, you know what, I don't have the URL directly, but Newsletter Fest, if you Google that, if you, if you I'm sure you'll get there. It's... Um, it's yeah, just you know, it's as they as they say on the stage of the Emmys or the Grammys or the Tonys, it's truly just an honor to be recognized, and that's one hundred percent true. It's basically the well, exact same metrics, right? That we're looking at here. 
Well, I am a loyal subscriber to your newsletter, and I think <laughs> it is you. an awesome newsletter. I highly recommend it to everybody. Uh, man, we've got lots of people from all over the world here. We've got uh, Gregory from Trinidad and Tobago. We've got Sven from Germany. We've got Ryan Baker from Philadelphia. <laughs> Uh, we've got uh, Mary and, and Chris are here. Chris is complimenting you on your your color coded bookshelf. Um, and uh, thank you, Chris. Chris is good to see, good to hear from you, Chris. It looks a little askew, doesn't it? It, it does. Little, it it does. You, I, don't, um, I don't know why. I think it's the camera. It's not the like. I'm not on. I'm not on a hill. Or this way, I guess I'm not on a hill. Just for anybody who's wondering, is this aunt, like is one of her legs shorter than the other? Or what's going on there? No, it's just. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it just happens. It's okay. It's just the um, Mary Drummond is a, is a big fan. Um, I don't know if you know Mary Ann, but if you don't, you should, because Mary mm -hmm. is awesome. Um, and she's been writing to one person as well. Fantastic. Uh, so yeah, thank she, you. Mentions the, uh, she mentions the Warren Buffett example there. I just talked about this yesterday, actually. I was doing a webinar uh, on creating fantastic newsletter experiences in part um and uh, i talked about warren buffett and the warren buffett example for people who don't know as mary just mentioned is that you know warren buffett icon of industry chairman of berkshire hathaway and every year he writes a letter to shareholders to all of the uh shareholders of berkshire hathaway but also he he also um writes it to like the press it gets picked up in you know every news outlet around the world because people want to know what does warren buffett think about the state of business in any given year you know 2018 19 20 and 21 it just came out uh this past february actually a couple of weeks ago and so it, it gets tons and tons of play like tons of people read this millions of people like i would posit um read warren buffett's letter to shareholders but the story is that when Warren sits down to write that letter to shareholders after the turn of the year, every year, he doesn't think about those tens of thousands of people. He thinks about one person, he thinks about his sister, Doris. And he says he writes to her because she is a shareholder of Berkshire Hathaway. She's smart, she reads a lot, but she doesn't know all the financial jargon and, and she doesn't need to. And so he says, I try to say on paper what I would tell her about the business if we sat down for an afternoon. And I like I so I talk about writing to Doris as a way to think about your own communication, you know, certainly newsletters, 100 percent, but almost anything that you're doing. Like, I think write to Doris is basically a marketing superpower. The more you can think about who is your Doris, um, you know, it makes your communication a whole lot more accessible and personable. Um, number one, but also it reminds you of who is important to you and who isn't important to you. Like, it's just important to think about who is your Doris as much as it is to think about who isn't your Doris, who's not your Doris. And so I think it helps clarify like who is the most important person to your business and how do we actually meet his or her or, or their needs. I love that. And I'm gonna be thinking about my Doris going forward. Uh, we yeah. talked to, off stage right before we started about how I've never been one to use really difficult vocabulary. I don't own a thesaurus. I don't look up fancy words to sound smart. I just talk like I, or I, I write like I talk. And, uh, but what, what I've really been focused on for a while now is the, the role of communication in customer experience. And of course that starts with marketing or advertising. That's often the first experience we have with the brand. But even when we become customers, the number of times that a company communicates with us, it could be a welcome letter, it could be the website that we go to, it could be a sign if there's a physical location, it could be a contract or an invoice or some legal disclosure. Those are all opportunities to create an experience. Yeah. And on, our, on my podcast called Experience This, we call that making the required remarkable. It's a required part of your business maybe to have a contract or to have an invoice but it doesn't mean that it has to be a boring part of your business. It can be a place where you have some fun. And one mm -hmm. of the reasons why I love reading your newsletter is that you have a wicked sense of humor and, and it always gives me some sort of a, a chuckle. And I kind of know that, that you're coming at something from an interesting perspective. So it's <laughs> not just, Anne talks about marketing. It's yeah. you get Anne's personality infused in it and that's what makes it so great. So yeah. I always recommend well, thank that. You for that. Uh, companies as yeah, well. And, and actually that's intentional because when I, you know, one of the, one of the metrics that I look at for not just my own content, but for any content that I'm, that I'm reading or, or looking at is, you know, if you cover up the logo on your website, on your social channels, or if you cover up the from 
um, the, the, the send line on your, like of your, of an, your email, your email newsletters, your, any of your email marketing, you know, does it sound different? Does it sound like you? Um, and so that's an intentional differentiator that, that I, you know, layer on because I don't want it to sound like Dan. I don't want it to sound like Dan. I guess I want it to sound like Ann Hanley, right? So I want you to be aware of the fact that this is me speaking to you. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that is a very intentional thing that I do. But that doesn't come, by the way, on the first draft either. Like, it's interesting to me that I was just, I was just slightly distracted by what you said a second ago about um, how you write like you talk, how you write like you talk. And I think that's true to some degree, but I, I also don't think it's entirely true because I've read your writing, I've read your book, and I can hear your voice in it, but you don't really write like you talk. Like I think that you have, your, your voice is definitely throughout the book, but writing and speaking are two very different disciplines, right? And so, you know, if you write like you talk, like to me that when I hear people say that, oh, just write like you talk, kind of don't do that. Because like, if you were to read the transcription of this conversation here today, it wouldn't be perfect. It would be meandering and be a little all over the place. It'd be some asides and some ums and some ahs. And like, that's writing as you speak. But I think the important thing is to take that sort of rough, um, take that that bit of concrete and shape it into something that's inherently more readable, right? And so, yes, I think writing like you talk means that you include your voice in there, but don't just publish your first draft, which is what I often think that people do when they well, or what they what they think we're saying when we say write like you talk. Um, you sure. know, my newsletter that's like that's four drafts. That's about four drafts before I finally get the humor and my personality and the feeling that it's coming from Anne. Um, and so that's, that's eight hours of work creating this, this newsletter, which is enormous, right? So when people hear that, they're like, holy wow, I can't do that. And it's like, you can do that because it's an important part of my marketing. And that's how I, I, you know, like I'm valuing it such. Um, For sure. and so it's just a matter of, of sort of what your priorities are. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Uh, I think what I just meant was I don't use big vocabulary in real life either. Yeah. Yeah. I don't talk in acronyms, so I don't write in acronyms, right? But a lot yeah. of companies do. Um, there's a, a there's a great story in my book about a, a about a bank that sent a, a an email to the daughter of a Forrester a VP. So he's a Forrester analyst. He, he focuses on uh, on customer experience, and the daughter gets this email, and the email subject line has seven words in it, three of which are acronyms, and she doesn't know what those acronyms mean. Right. And so she sent she sent the email to her father, the VP at, at Forrester, and said, is this even English? And, and so then he wrote a post about it. And I wrote about his post because I thought it was so fascinating that that a bank thinks that sending an email like that. I mean, that makes sense to the people at the bank. It's just not how people talk or how people mm -hmm. understand English. Right. So yeah, that's, that's yeah. what I meant by it. Um, but yes, you definitely have to. You can't just spew out words um, and uh, and then. And, and and not do any editing or cleaning up of that. Yeah, um, so yeah. Clearly, that bank did not think about their doors, right? Because in, in for some some segments of their audience, like maybe they would have a doors that connects with acronyms, you know. So again, kind of come comes back to doors always. It definitely does. So in what you 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 briefly mentioned this before, but in what I am sure is going to become the the pinnacle of your career, uh, you did write. <laughs> forward to my new book called The Experience Maker, How to Create Remarkable Experiences That Your Customers Can't Wait to Share. And I have to tell you, and I know that when I first uh, approached you, you were like, why is this guy asking me to write the forward? And I, before you wrote it, my feeling was, I sit at, I feel like I sit at the intersection section of marketing and customer experience, as I said earlier. And so I really thought it made sense to go find somebody who was in marketing versus mm -hmm. somebody in customer experience. But then after you wrote the forward and I read it and I loved it and I laughed and I cried and I realized <laughs> how great you are at describing experiences, I literally felt like I found the absolute perfect person on the planet. So um, give us a little bit of a hint, you know, don't spoil it all, but give us a little bit mm. of a hint of the experience that you wrote about um, in your forward. Yeah, so first of all, um, yeah, everything that, that Dan said was 100% true when he approached me. I was like, what, why, why me? Like, And um, 
but you know, the more that we talked and, and, you know, after he sent me four pages of notes about why I was the right person. And <laughs> then he, I guess like the straw for me was when he showed up at my house, you guys. <laughs> With flowers, fine, right? Fine, fine. For God's sakes. He had a little Danbury mint, you know, um, 62 Corvette. It was incredible. I was like, wow, that's a replica. Look at that. The hoses are going the right way. Everything about it was just to a T. Um, um, anyway, um, that was a callback. The, uh, <laughs> great one too. Very good. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, what was the question? Oh, what I wrote about. So first of all, Dan's book is fantastic. Um, if you have not pre-ordered it yet, please do. It's just, it's such a great read. Uh, first of all, Thank second you. of all, um, yeah, I, so I wrote about um, my experience uh, visiting a three-star Michelin restaurant in Oslo, Norway. And uh, I use that as a lens to talk about the importance of crafting a, an experience. And it has relevance, I think, for everybody, whether you run a three-star Michelin restaurant, a two-star, or one-star, whatever the case may be, or whether you run a B2B technology company because the lessons apply across the board. Um, so yeah, so that's what I wrote about and just about how they created a story, how they built anticipation and how they really were so plugged into creating, yes, the on-site experience of you know the food and all that stuff, but more broadly thinking about how they are connecting with customers way before you step into the restaurant actually way before you even you know get a reservation um so yeah i think that there's so many lessons that i that i talk about in dan's book and that um that, that i think dovetail really nicely into into what you talk about more generally dan in the book as well well and i i literally felt like i was there with you in in oslo and i've never been to oslo uh but i i felt like i was with you at this restaurant the descriptions were just amazing and yeah, what I loved that you, I love that you picked a restaurant example because in my book, I actually talked to Stephanie Izard, who is an Iron Chef and uh, has number of restaurants in Chicago, uh, all goat themed. That's her. That's her theme: little goat and all that stuff. And uh, I talked to her and I asked her, you know, you are an Iron Chef. You've you've done all the shows. You're a celebrity chef. And yet you're also an entrepreneur because you own all these restaurants. Help me understand what is the division of importance between the quality of the food and the quality of the experience. Now, mm -hmm. I expected her as a chef to tell me 80-20 food. She actually answered 50-50, which mm -hmm. I thought was surprising, but also very impressive. And she, you know, she basically said, look, you know, I know the food's gonna be good. And the food is certainly probably what brings people in, but the experience is what brings people back. And so it's just as important that we provide them with an amazing experience as it is that we provide them with great food. So if right, an iron chef yeah. is doing that, right? I think it's something we can yeah. all learn from. Yeah, and think about like just the wisdom in that because the food is the product essentially. And the product can be anything, right? It can be anything from a, a Danbury Mint Corvette to you know a B2B solution. Um, and so I think that's the product and that's almost like, yes, that's level set. Like you've got to be able to, or that's table stakes rather. It's like, that's the thing that you've got to, it's got to be good, right? You've got to deliver on that. But what's the overall experience that you're creating around that, the way you deliver it, the way you're communicating, the story that you're telling, the way you're putting that product or service or food in the context of the lives of the people who matter to you and to your business. And so I think all of that is so universal. It is, and, and one of the things that you that you finished your forward by saying was that this meal that you described was what six seven years ago, and yeah. you still remember I it. Still like still think about it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I do. and you can write about it with such detail, and and that's because obviously the the, the meal was great, but it was the experience that surrounded it. That's what you're really remembering. Uh, so I loved it. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I got to thank you publicly. I've, I've thanked you privately, but um, <laughs> it, it was a true honor to have you at the at the top of my book, um, introducing it. And I, I so appreciate it. So um, definitely, uh, if you would like to pre-order, uh, I would certainly appreciate it. Um, I'm telling you, the book is worth it just for Anne's forward. You can just read the forward <laughs> and then throw the rest of the book out and you're going to still believe. I don't that you think got that's true. That is not true. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, anyway, Anne, we just have a couple minutes left. Uh, just yep. wondering if you uh, would like to leave us with, what are you working on right now? What are you excited about as we uh, as we enter sort of the middle of 2021? Things are starting to open back up. We've got hope in the air. Um, what are you What are you excited about right now? Yeah, so um, let me see. So I'm working on a new book that I I'm not really I'm not really prepared to talk about right now, but that's uh, that's kind of in my brain. It's I've been I, I've talked about it in in my newsletter in the past, and I've talked about it you know publicly a little bit. But you know, I, it's been a challenge for me over the past year of the pandemic, just with all of the other stuff going on, just the you know just the emotion of it, just the heaviness of it. It's just it's just everything. It's been a very difficult year for me just to, to, to think about, you know, how do you actually create something new? Like some of my friends have been incredible. Like they've produced amazing work throughout this pandemic, you know, but it's for me, it, it's just like, I've been so distracted by world events and by so much going on that it's been harder for me to focus. So, but I, so in some ways, the fact that we're coming out of this does feel a little bit lighter to me. So I, I feel like I'm able to focus a, a whole lot more than I, than I have been. Um, so that's the first thing. And, uh, and yeah, the second thing is marketing process, has tons of stuff going on. We're really expanding our education and training programs. So that's been a major, major focus as well. We've recently gotten into consulting for the very first time ever. So that's been another uh, huge focus uh, for us at marketing profs. We just wrapped up our B2B forum online. Um, and it's the first time this year, it'll, um, it'll be twice this year, it'll be it was last week and then it'll be also this October. So yeah, lots of stuff going on personally and professionally. And then uh, finally, I'm sitting here in my, my little puppy August is um, right beside me. He's directly under the heater. It's a little nippy here in Boston this morning. So so yeah, he's just, uh, he brings joy to my life. So that's the other thing that's going on for me. <laughs> I, I, uh, I acquired a, uh, a senior shelter dog during COVID. Oh, as well. did you? Oh, fantastic. She's awesome. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Anne. I, I really appreciate you taking the time out uh, yeah, today. Thank you. Um, everybody go, if you are not, if you're not already following Anne Hanley on all of the channels, please stop what you're doing and go do that. She's at Ann Hanley on Twitter, also at Marketing Props on LinkedIn, all over the place. Go follow her work and you will learn, you will laugh and uh, and you'll be a better person for it. So thank you so much, Ann. Great to see you. Thank and you for having me. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, and next week we are gonna completely shift gears and I am bringing to the show a very old friend of mine. His name is Adam Kaplan. He's actually the director of a boys overnight camp called Camp Nebagaman in upstate Wisconsin. He was my counselor when I was a camper at Camp Nebagaman and he is now the owner of the camp. And uh, my son now is a camper there. And we're gonna talk about the experience of camping and especially in the COVID age, they are getting ready for a full season of overnight camp. And, uh, and it's gonna be a little bit different than the past, but uh, it's still gonna be an incredible experience. I will tell you, the five years that I was at camp were absolutely life-changing for me and, and really shaped who I am. So I thought it would be really fun to go talk about that as a means to uh, channel some customer experience from, uh, from an earlier stage in life. I'm Dan Gingas, customer experience speaker and coach. Thanks so much for being with me this week and every week on The Experience Maker. We're here at noon Eastern on Thursdays. We'll see you next week. Have a great rest of the day and a terrific weekend.